It's my honor to introduce our two distinguished speakers today. Habas El Gamaz, the Hitachi America Professor in the School of Engineering and Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford. He is also the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2016 Richard W. Hamming Medal and the 2012 Claude E. Shannon Award. His research spans several areas, including network information theory, field programmable gate arrays, and digital imaging devices and systems. His research group is currently involved in projects in smart grids. Ram Rajagopal is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, and associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, and the founder and director of the Stanford Sustainable Systems Lab. He specializes in creating and deploying large sensing systems and using the generated data together with no novel statistical algorithms and stochastic control to achieve sustainable transportation, energy, and infrastructure networks. So with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Abbas and Ram. Hi. Um, first, we're going to tell you a little bit about why we decided to offer this course. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, the course itself. Uh, and then in the last part, we're going to give you a very brief, uh, uh, very brief uh, overview of battery systems and their applications in transportation and grid services and highlight uh, some of the content of the course. Uh, the high level motivation for offering this course and for our research in general is uh, climate change, which is uh, caused by carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels. Transportation and electricity generation contribute the majority of uh, these types of carbon emissions. And um, high capacity battery systems, which have been developed recently, are playing a, a very important, a key role actually in curbing carbon emissions through electrification of transportation and by addressing uh, the renewable energy variability. Uh, so if you look at the curriculum uh, for battery systems, existing courses such as uh, these ones from uh, Stanford uh, offer excellent in-depth understanding of some aspects of battery systems. Um, however, because battery systems is highly interdisciplinary and applied in nature, uh, there is no course that takes a holistic system-oriented approach uh, to battery systems. So that's one of the things that we uh, wanted to accomplish with this course. In addition to the um, curricular need, um, there is one more reason we specifically decided to teach this class. Uh, storage systems have been playing a major role in our research work on the new grid. So here in the figure, you can see the traditional grid structure. So we have generation supplying power to consumers and power flows from left to right on this figure. Um, in a traditional grid, we don't have uh, storage. Therefore, generation has to meet demand at every point in time. But the grid is changing significantly. In the supply side, we're seeing the adoption of renewables, wind and solar, for example, as well as the addition of transmission scale storage. On the consumer side, behind the meter, we are seeing the adoption of uh, rooftop TVs, smart appliances, and electric vehicles. One kind of uh, important question is, how can we use all of these resources in order to support the rest of the ecosystem? To do that, you need to account for various considerations. First, the fact that if we wanna coordinate all these elements, we need to account for cyber constraints. Second, we need to account for the preferences of consumers. And third, for all the physical network constraints. And this is kind of has been a key driving question of the research we have been doing here at Stanford. And one important point is as we design systems that can do this type of coordination for EV charging or for distributed energy resources in homes and buildings, um, we need realistic and detailed resource models. And as I mentioned earlier, battery storage is an important resource, 
but in EV charging, the battery inside the car is another resource. So since 2016, we have been uh, doing this uh, project called PowerNet, which is all about how to use the cloud to coordinate resources in the home. It's a project in partnership with Google, Sonen, a battery systems company, Semtech Drive, a motor systems company, and the Navy. The project has kind of four important elements. Um, I'll start with the home hub, which is kind of an intelligence that sits in the home and com communicates to all of the local resources. One of these local resources is a smart panel that has power electronics that's set in the home and is designed at Stanford. Now the home hub uses its local intelligence to optimize what the storage, EV charging, solar can do for the home and accounts for all of the customer preferences. Now we may want to coordinate resources across homes to achieve goals such as shaving the peak or automating the response to prices. And in order to do that from the cloud, we have a cloud coordinator, which does a planning step um, day in advance. So those are the two kind of main components of PowerNet. Let's see in a little bit more detail what's inside. When we are designing this planning intelligence in PowerNet, we have to account for four major constraints, customer preferences, the network physics, meaning the power network constraints, the delays or the cyber constraints. So in, in this figure, you can see it's represented as a delay in obtaining data from the edge of the grid. Um, and finally, the fourth one and very important one is one major resource that we utilize to achieve our goals is storage. And we need accurate models for storage. One, for capturing its aging and incorporating that as part of the cost. And two, for understanding if I send a signal to storage, how it responds and incorporating that in all the algorithms. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have designed um, with uh, faculty such as Professor Juan Rivas, who will also be teaching in our course, um, a power electronics device, a smart dimmer fuse that can be used to control the panel in your home. Um, various types of algorithms use data generated by all these systems to make decisions. And then we are building several types of test beds. Um, the first one I want to mention is the PowerNet lab, the cell lab we have in Stanford in the Y22 building. And it basically has two homes set up in this lab. One of the homes has real appliances, fridges, dishwasher, air conditioner, water heater, a solar panel on the rooftop and actually battery storage device, as you can see there, they're from Tesla in this particular case. And then the other home um, has the ability to emulate various loads. Both homes are connected to the real distribution and transmission system, and we have the electronics to do that. All of these homes can be used for simulating real world conditions and testing algorithms and hopefully some of the data from this lab will be available for our class for students to utilize in projects. Together with our initial test bed, we built um, field tests. So right now we have deployed PowerNet in a farm. You can see there on the left-hand side on the bottom picture, that gray housing contains the battery storage that is used in managing solar power to cool a barn where uh, milk production uh, is happening. So we have seen tremendous potential for utilizing such technologies to reducing costs in dairy farms. In another test bed, we have recruited 35 homes here in the Bay Area that will have uh, solar storage, electric vehicles, and we will show the power of coordination. In this first project, we saw a lot about how to coordinate uh, stationary batteries in the context of uh, distributed energy resources and responding to prices and, and commands. Um, but how about charging? So charging is really about coordinating mobile batteries. And we just started a new project and program here in Stanford called EV50. And the goal of this is to figure out how to coordinate charging, particularly fast charging that generates incredible demand for the grid. Um, and both 
by using deferrable charging capabilities as well as potentially storage. And again, you have to account for the potential for two-way charging, the multiple stakeholders in this uh, coordination exercise that range from the car companies, the car owner, the charging company and the uh, utility, as well as various use cases. For example, um, having a fleet of autonomous vehicles offering um, ride sharing services versus deliveries versus individually owned cars. To do, for doing all this, we definitely need not just a detailed model of the grid, but a detailed understanding of the battery systems. So this has been a very strong motivator for us to teach this course. Okay, now I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the course itself. So the course provides a systems approach to studying uh, battery systems uh, rather than uh, an, um, uh, one of its uh, components. Uh, so to cover the various multidisciplinary and real-world aspects of battery systems, we decided on a, a mixture of a seminar and a regular course. Um, so it's a little bit of an unorthodox uh, course in that sense. Uh, like a course, uh, topics are streamlined. So in a seminar, you typically have a random set of uh, um, uh, lectures about various topics. Here we actually try to streamline the uh, the lecture so that uh, starting from basics and moving on to real world system considerations and case studies. Uh, like a seminar, however, we uh, to cover the breadth of the subject, uh, we've lined up an amazing set of experts in the various aspects of battery systems, including uh, academics, uh, five professors from Stanford other than uh, Ram and myself, uh, and two from other universities. Uh, two experts from national labs, INREL and Sandia, uh, and then uh, experts from industry, uh, Waymo, Tesla, EPRI, EVgo, and, and battery design. <clears throat> the course, uh, when we set it up, it's really intended to mezzanine level undergraduate and graduate students in engineering and related fields, as well as engineers, uh, professionals in industry who are interested in designing battery systems, uh, doing research on battery systems, applying them to transportation and the grid, uh, or just simply learning about battery systems. The course can be taken as a one unit, uh, credit, no credit only seminar, in which case uh, the student uh, doesn't really need to have any uh, particular prerequisite to take the class, except some kind of uh, uh, engineering background, for example. Uh, it can also be taken as a three unit uh, letter grade only seminar plus a project, uh, in which case we want to make sure that the student who decides to take it uh, for, a, uh, for a letter grade, that the project that the students uh, is, is going to do um, is something that he has the background to do. So, so uh, that the prerequisites really has to do with the project, uh, not the course itself. For example, if you wanted to do a project involving electrochemistry or, or, or materials, you need to have some background in, in, in electrochemistry and material science in order for us to say, yeah, that's, that seems like a good match. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm grouping, we group the, the topics of the class uh, as follows. Um, in the first, roughly speaking, in the first part of the course, we're going to talk about the battery systems themselves. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the materials, the battery cell, power electronics, um, uh, and battery system management. In the second part of the, of the course, again, roughly speaking, we're going to be talking about some uh, system considerations, uh, such as modeling, degradation, uh, thermal management, safety, and uh, finally something about uh, economics of batteries. And then in the third part will be uh, about uh, applications in electric vehicles and, and the grid. Uh, there is a detailed syllabus I believe is posted on the SCPD webpage which uh, lists uh, the lecture uh, uh, tentative titles and uh, the speakers.
so you can actually see the, the these topics mapped uh, to these uh, syllabus. So in the remaining part of the webinar, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about battery systems and uh, their applications in transportation and the grid. Um, Um, so uh, the, the graph on the left here, which you can't see very well, unfortunately, but it basically uh, shows the tremendous, shows two things. One is that battery systems are extremely old technology. Uh, it started in the uh, uh, 19th century and maybe earlier, even the 18th century. And over time and driven by various applications, the energy density, uh, which is the uh, watts hour per kilogram have been uh, increasing as the application needs uh, until, and then in 1992, there was a huge uh, jump in uh, energy density uh, by the development of uh, lithium uh, ion batteries. And these were actually, these were actually um, uh, driven by uh, portable electronic revolution. And today there are 2.7 billion um, uh, mobile phones that use uh, lithium ion batteries. The improvements in uh, battery uh, is not limited only to density, uh, energy density, but also to power density, uh, which here you can see it in terms of uh, uh, watts per liter or watts per uh, kilogram. And uh, because of these improvements, in addition to the improvement in, um, in uh, energy density, uh, the automotive and grid uh, services applications uh, became uh, uh, feasible. So on the left here, I'm showing a graph, uh, which is the market size for, uh, shows that the, mar that the market size for lithium ion batteries has been uh, dramatically increasing. And more interestingly, uh, the projection is that the, the uh, lithium ion batteries will be a $550 billion market, most of which uh, are for uh, transportation and uh, for uh, grid storage. Now, let me tell you a little bit about batteries themselves. So uh, the, the basic uh, component of a battery is the battery cell. Uh, which consists of an, an, an uh, anode, a cathode, and a, a separator in between them. Um, and uh, the cell chemistry, which is uh, the choices of materials and, and chemistries for the anode, the cathode, and the separator, uh, determines the key characteristics of the battery, such as uh, rate of voltage, energy density, power density, and uh, self discharge rate and, and, and thermal uh, properties. Um, and on the right here, you see uh, the basic uh, packages in which uh, the cells come in. Uh, there is an incredibly diverse set of chemistries used in lithium ion uh, batteries. And in the class, you're going to uh, hear more about this and about uh, the, uh, the, how the cells are designed. Uh, the main advantages of lithium ion battery, as we alluded to, um, is high voltage, uh, high power and improved density. But uh, lithium ion batteries have some uh, important limitations, um, uh, which uh, have to do with the high sensitivity to overcharging um, and uh, to the outside uh, temperature, uh, which affect capacity and, and discharge power, but they also are very important considerations for safety. Um, another aspect, another limitation is that aging, um, and uh, which is not completely well understood. And uh, again, it can lead to uh, safety issues. And you will hear about these in detail in the class. <laughs> the battery is uh, more than a cell. Um, first, the batteries are first. The uh, the uh, cells are arranged in series and parallel to achieve the voltage and uh, power and uh, um, energy requirement uh, of the application. Um, and then the modules are arranged uh, into the battery system itself, together with power electronics, uh, thermal management uh, 
uh, types of uh, mechanical design. Uh, and these are all managed using the battery management system. And again, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about this in detail uh, in the class. Now let's go into a couple of applications on battery, <coughs> battery systems. We want to start with transportation. So 70 million uh, EVs per year are expected to be sold by 2040. That roughly corresponds to 85% of the cars in the road. EVs present advantages which go beyond them being green. Uh, one of them is that you have a much higher energy conversion efficiency as compared to internal combustion engines, and they have lower maintenance costs. The evolution of the lithium ion batteries in terms of the power density and energy density is actually enabling these electric vehicles to achieve similar range as what we see today in gasoline powered cars. And here we can see kind of a typical configuration in which kind of electric vehicles are built. This is called a skateboard platform. You can see the battery system right there. Um, and it's connected to a drivetrain and has power electronics to manage the charging um, as well as the connection to the drivetrain. The battery pack itself is very similar to what uh, Professor Al Gamal showed before, except it is going to have a much more robust thermal and uh, mechanical um, management comp or components. And one of the keys in when you're kind of designing the battery system for a car is that you need to account for sp specific characteristics regarding lifespan, safety, cost, performance, and the energy density and power density needs of the battery system for a car. And this is kind of a key aspect that we wanna bring into our class. Another important aspect is how do we design the battery management system itself to satisfy the needs of the automotive applications. We are bringing several speakers from academia and industry to explain these to us. Another important issue for electric vehicles is how you refuel them or charging. And the increase in level three charging, that's the fastest charging rates you see out there, will result on dramatic impacts in terms of power in the grid. And unless we figure out ways to coordinate this charging, this will represent an enormous issue for scaling the adoption of electric vehicles. So we mentioned earlier the EV50 project that we have started at Stanford is addressing some of that, but charging and its impacts will also be a key aspect that we will address in the class. Finally, um, batteries, when they reach about 70% of their capacity due to aging, um, they need to be <laughs> recycled. And actually the way that happens is you not just have recycling, you have reuse, refabrication, and even reselling. And so this whole life cycle process of the batteries is something we will have a lecture on in our course and is very critical to the industry. Now just a brief overview of battery systems for the grid and for particularly or for grid services. So grid storage, which is the ability to store electricity now and use it later, has been increasing dramatically. And you can see here in the figures that lithium ion batteries correspond to a lion's share of that increase in terms of energy and power. Storage is used in many different places in the grid. So in this figure, you can see it's used with generators, for example, to support applications such as outage management, uh, directly connected to the transmission system to participate in the wholesale markets, connected at the substation to help manage the distribution network for utility, connected to the secondary transformer, um, again, to help the utilities, and finally, customers may own batteries to kind of do their own um, demand management or bill management. The location and type of storage kind of determines what applications they can be used for 
and we have, as I mentioned earlier, various different types of applications. This is an important aspect of the use of storage and particularly the battery systems for storage and we will have experts on, on this topic speaking in our course. One specific application we wanted to highlight is regarding support for renewable generation. So the adoption of renewables is, causes significant issues for the grid. On the left-hand side, you can see in dark blue the demand profile here in California for this summer. I picked a day in the summer. And the curve that you see is called a duck curve, which means there is a significant ramping towards the end of the afternoon when the sun starts to set. We need the increasing adoption of solar will just exacerbate this issue. And if we add more and more renewables, you might end up with situations like what is shown on the figure in the right hand side, where we have a Texas system with 50% renewables. And because of the production of these renewables, we expect a lot of curtailment. So it's about 30 terawatt hours of energy per year um, in curtailments due to the variability that renewables are causing. Storage provides a very good option for addressing both of these issues. First, in the duck curve, storage can be used for storing energy during the the hours where the sun is shining and then using that energy in later hours of the day, eliminating those ramping issues. And second, in a grid where you have significant amount of renewables, just four hours of storage, for example, duration can, pro can allow you to recover in this particular Texas case, 28 terawatt hours of energy. And the capacity of the storage that's needed is only 14 gigawatts. So one key takeaway from these two studies um, is that short duration storage can solve a lot of these issues. So within a day and battery systems turn out to be a very attractive proposition for short duration storage. So here we are seeing the drive and the predictions in terms of adoption of battery technology for storage. And you can see it's expected to grow a lot up to 35 gigawatts by 2030, gigawatt hours by 2030. When you design battery systems for storage for the grid, you need to take into account considerations such as safety, cost, performance, and the lifespan. Particularly safety and cost are primary concerns and we're gonna have experts in our class talk about the design of battery systems specifically for storage applications. Thank you very much. And uh, we will go for So with that, I want to turn it over, back over to Abbas and Ram. We have a lot of questions that are coming in. I think the first one to ask that came in is just to, to circle back maybe uh, to, to the purpose of the course, and just again, and you touched on already, but developing a little bit further, if you are, a, if someone is a working professional in a particular area of battery systems, what do you think is the, what is the importance of this course for them, and, and what will they take away from it? Say they're working in materials or electrical chemistry. Um, I think these are the, exactly the type of people we designed this course for, which is to give uh, kind of an A to Z um, view of battery systems. Um, and even if you're working on a very specific area and batteries, it really helps a lot to put it in context so that you know how what you're doing affects the applications and how the, and how the application requirements affect your work. So uh, it's clearly something that will give you a very broad background on battery systems that would be extremely helpful if you're working on even if you're working on a very specific area in, 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 in or in applications, of course. And would this apply to say someone who's an economist or a public policy expert who's working in this field as well? Would this bring value to their background? I think so. Uh, we are having um, speakers who have those backgrounds as well, um, engineering economics, for example. And I think how this will apply for them is having a little bit of understanding of what battery systems technologies are capable of at what stage of their evolution they're in and what are the future potential 
will help inform a lot of that work. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have a lot of very specific questions about battery systems, so I'm going to jump into those. One that came up a lot are the, the sort of waste products of creating batteries. And is that something that will be addressed in the course? And do you have any comments or thoughts on that from your own research? Um, I, we brought in a speaker who will be speaking specifically about their own research on this topic of recycle and reuse. Um, what we, we are also learning on this topic, um, and it seems to be a key question for automakers and storage manufacturers in the world today. I think it's, it's, it's one of those uh, topics which is emerging uh, because store, uh, the uh, battery systems are still relatively new and you don't have a lot of <laughs> ones that are not in use already. Uh, people are starting to think about what to do with the batteries when the capacity degrades below a certain percentage, like 70% in the case of cars. And there are a lot of ideas emerging. So it's not an established area in which we can have uh, several speakers. It's just, it's an emerging area. You're gonna hear about it uh, towards the end of the class. And uh, it could be an area where somebody would be interested in a project, for example. Yeah. And, and it's important to note that one of the key aspects of recycling or reusing these batteries is understanding how to model their aging and so on. And that will be seen in tremendous amount of detail and the systems understanding in the course. Correct. Maybe re uh, related to that or building off that question, uh, we got a few questions about, it sounds like the course is focusing on lithium ion batteries. Uh, are solid state batteries, are they also something that will be touched on in the course? Is that also a technology that you think has promise in these applications? Uh, we're probably not the right people to uh, address the solid state uh, batteries. Um, however, uh, th this topic will come up. Um, uh, you know, Iswi and, uh, um, and Will uh, Chu from Stanford will be talking about, uh, I'm sure they're gonna touch on solid state batteries. And also uh, we are working on uh, uh, a panel at the end of the last class in which we'll talk about the future of battery systems. And I'm sure that will come up and you may hear it from other speakers. We're not sure, uh, you know, who exactly is gonna talk about it. So, okay. but yes, I mean, I'm sure it will come up. And, and, and always, again, the battery, electrochemistry is only one piece of this puzzle, how it fits with the rest of the system. Understanding that in the case of lithium ion will certainly help you understand what you need to do when you build those solid state batteries as well. And solid state still uses use lithium and there's still lithium ion. So it's not okay. like it's a different technology. It's just a better way of, uh, instead of the separators that they use now, that they use solid separators, which improve safety but it's still lithium ion, so. Will you touch on any other kinds of uh, storage? So there are a couple that are coming up, the one that was mentioned a few times, flywheel energy storage. Is no, that we outside? decided, uh, so we, this is an excellent question actually, because um, from the very beginning, we decided to focus on uh, battery systems and more specifically on lithium, you know, high capacity uh, systems. Um, in, in part because you can't really cover everything well. And uh, as if you look at the syllabus of the class, we can barely cover the topics on battery systems. So it seemed like it would be very, very diluted to, to add in more storage uh, systems. But of course, these other storage systems are very important. Uh, that does not, doesn't diminish their importance. It's just that we're not, we're just focusing on, on battery systems. And of course, that's, driven by transportation and as you have seen uh, there's still the majority of storage in the, in the grid. So. And, and just to add to that um, one of the short classes you mentioned early on touches upon you know flywheels and okay. so on and gives a good perspective of all different yeah. types of storage. Okay so in terms of the, the power net uh, project if I understood correctly it's sort of looking at the the use of energy within the home. Do you have other kind of load data for, uh, for other kinds of, um, I guess, other kinds of uses beyond sort of home appliance use? Yeah. Um, in fact, the project itself is being deployed in a farm. Okay, that's right. <laughs> setting. 
So we, we have looked at homes and farms and we are partnering with some organizations who are interested in utilizing the same technology on a building. Uh, the whole point of the project has been how to coordinate storage, solar, and the flexible load together in the context of a power network using the cloud. So. And are the, and the applications, the app, it applies easily to both? Are there what kinds of modifications have to happen between the two? I think um, they apply generally. You have to take into account the specific characteristics of the storage you're going to use, as well as the nature of the loads and the models you might need for those. So if I'm coordinating EV storage and solar, the nature of, of the flexibility of electric vehicle charging is different than if I'm trying to manage cooling, for example. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on the capacity constraint for a grid scale battery installation? In the capacity, I don't understand. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm misreading the question. Mm. So, uh, what I guess what kinds of capacity in terms of the grid? Uh, this this is something we will address in the no. class. It really depends on where you are co-locating it. Okay. If it is with a generator, typically is a couple of megawatts. If mm -hmm. it is at the building, you know, it's going to be in the hundreds of kilowatt hours or, you know, and if it is in the transmission system, the largest battery systems might have, you know, 100 megawatt hours or even more. So we're, we're starting to see, it's, it's again an emerging technology and there's a lot still happening as we speak. Does the course focus mainly on sort of the technology that's emerging in the US? Does it also look at how it's emerging in other places around the world? Mm, not sure there was any uh, foc uh, geographical focus of the course. Uh, all the speakers for logistical reasons uh, right. are coming from the US. Uh, so it may have a US bias. Um, but other than that, the technology itself, of course, uh, has no uh, has no geographical boundaries. But uh, uh, but I am assuming that, uh, for example, the people from EPRI who are going to talk about the grid the applications are probably going to focus on the U.S., uh, not uh, outside the U.S. But uh, there's a lot going on outside the U.S. So so hopefully we don't miss. <laughs> I mean, we didn't want to fly people from Europe or. Japan or China to, to talk That's about right. it, but uh, that Although, was the main you know, Some of the speakers seems to have done projects, you know, worldwide as yeah, well possible, and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, but what, what the focus of the class has been is really this A to Z understanding, mm -hmm. which was kind of uh, lacking in our view. And uh, if you are working in terms of a grid application or in the car, you may not know all the details of the battery and how to incorporate it. If you're now designing a cell, you don't know the details about how the grid applications work. And then if you're rethinking about the economics, reuse and all of that, you wanna understand all of this. Um, a lot of this is actually transferable knowledge. It's gonna be similar in the US yeah, definitely. Europe, yeah. and, definitely, and Asia. It's also, uh, the course also, a very important aspect of the course is uh, talking about issues uh, that come up uh, in these uh, high capacity uh, uh, battery systems in terms of safety, for example, which is one of the most important aspects. Uh, we have maybe the world expert on battery system giving a lecture on that from one of the uh, national labs. We have been working on this for about 15, 20 years, so we're going to hear um, you know, thermal issues, degradation issues, all of these are people are, you know, like degradation, for example, still an area of research. So some of the stuff you're going to hear about is really uh, state of the art. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, not, uh, it's not just old classical stuff, but some of it is, is still open. That's right. And that's why we decided to have projects because uh, people can look at some of these issues in more detail. And, and and it's worth pointing out kind of the reason we chose the structure for the class is that it allowed not just academics coming in and speaking about the topic on the cutting edge of the research, but also people who are building products in the real world 
for taking that academic research and transforming into actual um, exactly. engineered systems at scale. So you're going to have both points of view and a little bit broader understanding of all these issues. And that's what we mean by a systems approach. You look at the whole thing, you don't look at uh, just one aspect of it and, and, and just spend the whole, uh, which, which is very important for people working on such aspects. Like if you're designing a cell, you do need to take <laughs> the classes that talk about, you need strong background in electrochemistry and material science and so on. So that doesn't take away from any, any of these components. If you, if you are gonna design the power electronics, you need to be an expert in power electronics. You cannot just take our course and design power electronics. So, uh, but we wanted to just give people a broad exposure so that they, uh, they say, oh, I see how this affects this and what the issues are and, and, and what the impact of certain things will be on other things, that kind of, so that's what I mean by systems. Uh, and it's very unusual to have this type of systems oriented classes uh, in universities in general. I mean, it's, it's something that's most the industry does. Right? So we're bringing some of that in. Uh, that's right. So that would be a good segue to just build on, on the project itself. Um, so a few questions coming in about that. When students enter the class, do they need to have a project in mind or is that something that can develop during the quarter? We are going to have a handout in the first week of the class, which contains suggestions for projects in different areas that we collected from some of the speakers and from ourselves. Um, and so they are welcome to choose from these projects. They have ideas of their own, that's terrific. <laughs> you would never tell somebody, you know, an idea, you know, you shouldn't exp explore your idea. So I think uh, both. And then in terms of, of the project itself, so it sounds like if you didn't have a background in power electronics, it's unlikely you're gonna do a project in power electronics. So the project will really build on whatever expertise the student is building into the class, incorporating this new broader uh, understanding of the battery systems. And, Perfect. Yeah. And of course, you know, projects are, are being done in groups, project groups. So Similar. somebody in your group could have the expertise as well. So, so there's... <laughs> yeah, it could be interdisciplinary. But actually part of the project proposals, there will be a project proposal first before we say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And the project proposal will include in it What's your background? You know, why do you think you can actually do this project, right? Yeah. Tell me, you know, what do you know that, that makes you qualified to embark on this project? It's a, you can look at this class, it's not a traditional class in which you have a professor who knows everything uh, and, and, and then just feeding the information into the students. This is a community class. Okay. You have people coming from different backgrounds, from different things, they're bringing different ideas. And we're all going to learn. <laughs> we're learning as much as any of the students. And, and that's the purpose of it. It's building a learning community rather than just a, a regular uh, class in which the professor is God. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, so the idea would be hopefully to get a diverse student body, to bring in a range of expertise to really build and develop, uh, develop and share that knowledge and share that expertise that's across exactly. teams and across. And the project works as an anchor for that student to go into specific topics that he may want to yeah. learn in more depth. Uh, this is uh, not a question that's come in, but just out of curiosity, why do you think the system approach is not as common at, at academic institutions? Why is it more of an industry approach? Um, I think it's because um, in the university you're teaching people mostly about basics. Mm -hmm. And so it's very disciplinary approach to teaching. In research, uh, on the other hand, you have multidisciplinary research in the universities, of course, especially Stanford, right? Uh, but uh, by and large, the courses tend to be very um, disciplinary. And, um, uh, but, but I think we've been talking about this among each other for a long time, is that we do need to introduce the system <laughs> approach it's like product design would be another um, example of system approach, mm -hmm. right? So there are examples of system approach, but it's not the, the normal. <laughs> That's right. I, I think in general, um, when a field is starting out, it's a lot harder to, to get this kind of what is the systems approach that's happening there. And it makes it harder to organize the traditional courses. Um, but I think right now what we're seeing is really a lot of the components in a lot of technologies are mature 
and the value is in the system. So I'm hoping to see more and more sure. classes of this yeah. type. Excellent. Yeah. So we're, we're nearing the end. I have a few more sort of battery specifics. So maybe coming back to the technology uh, side. In terms of, so you talked about the grid technology, you talked about the battery technology. Um, I know you also talk about embedded systems, and maybe I'm interpreting this question incorrectly, but what do you see as the future in terms of new sensing technology to track things like the aging of batteries or to, and what are their applications to this kind of system? Yeah, so I think there is uh, some of the speakers are going to touch upon those topics. Um, I myself am not an expert, but some of the things that I've read about are things like uh, measuring physical properties of the battery, such as how much they expand with heat and so on, and, and using sensors more inside the cell. Um, but both the new types of sensing that might happen, as well as potentially how to use it, I think those could be great topics for projects for the course. No question. This would be the most interesting, actually one of the most interesting areas is um, there's still a need for um, sensing in the battery. Um, and um, hopefully some of the speakers will touch on these things. Uh, we'll see how it, uh, yeah, how it develops. Yeah. Well, they touch on other aspects. So another uh, question that's come up or, or comment is, the use of the cars themselves as a but already regenerative braking, but also the kinetic motion of the car. Is that something that will also be touched on the way to, to better utilize, yeah, the, what's using the, the, the energy to also create energy? Um, we're not really emphasizing the mechanical, the cars to, so much in themselves. Again, you know, there are courses that have been offered before about EVs specifically. So we're not talking too much about powertrains and and, uh, and and braking and this kind of thing too much. I mean, I'm sure it will come up. Uh, uh, we have a speaker from uh, Wymo who will talk about how would you go about designing various uh, types of transportation. You know, how do you size the battery? How do you do this and that? So probably he may touch on some of these things, but this is not definitely not the. Again, we tried to strike a balance between. Uh, being broad, but not being so diluted, so that something <laughs> there's a certain amount of material. It's only a ten week, you know, uh, the, the quarter is pretty short, yeah. and uh, the, we felt that this is the most we could do within this uh, ten weeks. And, so. and obviously, uh, for the course participants, they can always put forward questions to experts who have designed this battery exactly. system for yeah. real cars out there. <clears throat> yeah. So. So I think the last question, maybe if you can each touch on what do you see as the most promising development or new development in this field as you look at it from your perspective? I think uh, from my perspective, uh, obviously the applications and what you can do with them, it's just amazing. But in order to achieve that in a massive way, we really need to bring down the cost of these battery systems. That was my motivation. <laughs> getting involved in this is I use these things in applications and I want to figure out, you know, one, how to incorporate all of its characteristics in a better way, but also is there something we can bring from that side to kind of help in this cost reduction? Um, I think cost is the most important. <laughs> okay. Uh, without bringing, I mean, if you had talked to people about batteries six years ago, about using them in the grid or in cars or in 10 years ago or something, they would say, oh, no, 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 it's just way too expensive, right? So the technology that in terms of power density and energy density have gotten to the point where it's actually can enable a lot of things, but the cost stands in the way and the safety. So, so I think safer, lower cost, will be the emphasis in the future, uh, not necessarily making uh, power density higher by a significant amount or, or energy density higher by a significant amount. So that's basically my, so the innovations I think are gonna be mostly in, in these areas. I don't, they could come from various directions. I don't really know how uh, uh, it's gonna happen. But. Great, well, thank you very much for your, for your time. We didn't get to all the questions we will be making a recording of this presentation available in about a week. And uh, if you're interested 
in finding out more information about the class, you can go to either of these two websites and search for EE292X or battery systems. So thank you, Professors El Gamal and uh, Raja Gopal. Thank you. Thank you.